Well, good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder and this is BRN AM for Friday, June 26th, 2020. And our top stories today, workforce confidence is on the rise and a giant financial firm shakes up recruiting. Joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, Devin Banerjee, Senior Financial Services Editor for LinkedIn. And he's also the editor of the This Week in Finance newsletter, which you can find on the LinkedIn platform. Just click Devin's name and you can sign up. Devin, thanks for joining us in the program this morning. Absolutely, Jeff. Always good to be with you. Yeah, it's great to check in with you and the team at LinkedIn every Friday to find out what's happening in social media and what's happening on the platform. So Devin, lots of news this week, I would imagine. Lots of interesting economic news. What's top of mind for you and the team? Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. As with many of the recent weeks, you know, economic updates are really top of mind for folks. And, you know, I, I like to start this segment in recent weeks with just some of the key economic data and indicators, because as I talk to people, even in my in my personal life, there's so much data coming out and it's hard to kind of parse and know what to pay attention to. So I want to start with data we just got this morning. We're recording this on Thursday this yeah. week. Um, initial jobless claims for last week came in at about 1.5 million. Uh, that was higher than expected. Of course, it's down from previous weeks and months. But generally, I would say the reaction on the platform and among uh, you know labor market watchers has been that this is kind of a concerning figure for three months into this crisis for one and a half million new jobless claims uh, to be filed in one week. Stepping back this week, I also want to point to uh, the IMF's latest forecasts. Um, quite a significant downgrade in the IMF's outlook for the global economy. The IMF is now projecting a deeper recession and a slower recovery than it itself had projected just two months ago. So for 2020, globally, the IMF is looking at a 4.9% uh, contraction globally. And that's versus a 3% contraction that it had forecast uh, for the year just in April. So as I said, a significant, significant downgrading of its outlook there. That 4.9% uh, you know, contraction globally to put in dollar figures is about a $12.5 trillion uh, loss economically globally. So what's driving this increased pessimism from the IMF uh, is chief economist Gita Gopinath was out there quite a bit this week. Uh, we checked in with her a couple of days ago as well. You know, she's looking at a larger than anticipated supply shock during these lockdowns uh, that we've had the past few months globally. A continued and prolonged hit to demand as well from social distancing, uh, other social protective measures. And what's interesting is, you know, she said for those nations struggling to control the outbreak, uh, lockdowns will only persist longer than anticipated. So, you know, and by the way, the U.S. really fits into this category of nations struggling to control the spread. And of course, the U.S. is the world's largest economy. Just this morning, as we're talking right now, actually, you know, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, has uh, has, has extended um, or has has halted the economic reopening of mm -hmm. that state. Um, cities like Houston are now projected to you know, saturate their medical infrastructure by the 4th of July. So as I said, countries are really struggling to, to control the outbreak. And that prospect of uh, continued lockdowns is really what's driving this pessimism. I should just say these projections from the IMF assume that countries with these with uh, declining infection rates won't need to reinstate strict lockdowns, which of course is is an okay assumption to have, but not a guarantee in that case. So the IMF is assuming that testing, contact tracing, isolation will be enough for those countries that do have a hold on this outbreak. But as I said, that is not a guarantee. Um, some downside risks to this to this projection from the IMF, of course, continued outbreaks, continued lockdowns, also tightening financial conditions. If you know the movement of money, the supply of credit seizes up again, uh, that could really send shocks through these uh, through these economies globally. 
And the upside to these projections would, of course, be a medical breakthrough yeah. and also a resumption in business activity that is uh, more quick than anticipated. Well, you know, as it relates to the IMF numbers, we just have more data, right? I mean, you were talking about um, you know, going from 3.0 to negative or to 4.9%. Yeah. Uh, we just have more data. I think there's more out there. And every day we learn something new. Uh, but it is obviously disconcerting. Uh, we were told to expect this as it relates to the uh, second wave of the coronavirus, uh, you know, whether or not people are actually still practicing social distancing and doing the things yeah. that they need to do. They need to continue to do that. But it just seems like it, this is expected. And obviously the health issues will take precedence, but they'll have an impact economically and on the markets. And, and I, you know, I've obviously been talking and listening to what's on the platform and talking to other people. And they also expect that the recovery will take longer. It will not be the uh, aforementioned V recovery that I think has been talked about before. It's just not going to happen in that matter. So uh, more data, more information. It's more of a wait and see. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and what this data is really allowing people to do is really home in and focus on what the real risks are. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, Annie Lowry, who's a well-known, well-read uh, economic reporter and commentator, had a, a really popular piece out this week, uh, very popular on LinkedIn as well, talking about the major factors terrifying economists right now. And uh, first and foremost is a, a drying up of uh, government intervention. You know, as we talk about, yes, this is a health pandemic, but what we can really control is uh, fiscal support, mm -hmm. uh, you know, monetary policy. Um, and so the concern that that would dry up because of politics or because of or, or because of other policy um, moves is is of top concern. Uh, number two, she pointed to is of course consumer spending shrinking. So again, that demand shock uh, lasting longer than anticipated. Uh, none, another one she pointed to is of course major industries like airlines, you know, travel, leisure restaurants, small businesses just facing a protracted slump. And a fourth one that she focused on, which we don't, we, you know, societally don't talk enough about, and us in the media, I think as well, is a fiscal cliff, you know, for cities and states and uh, municipalities. I mean, tax revenue, other sources of income for governments has really collapsed. Yep. Uh, that the prospect of massive service cuts, you know, essential services, even, and job, job losses in the public sector is 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 really pronounced. I was doing some research, and I think and, you know, Michigan, Michigan's facing a three billion budget gap this year, probably a four billion one next year. They've instituted a work share plan uh, for public employees, where two out of three state employees have been partially furloughed. In New Jersey, Jeff, in, in your neck of the woods, the state government has moved a hundred thousand workers to abbreviated schedules. You know, public schools are sh shedding positions across the country in greater volume than during the Great uh, Recession. And, and so that fiscal cliff and the millions of people who work in public administration and our public sector employees, that risk is uh, very high right now as well. Yeah, and, and for the most part, other than teleworking, they really haven't been as negatively impacted. But agreed, if you don't have the tax revenue, you can't yeah. pay for services, and then you have to start looking at ways to trim, the, trim uh, back and that has an impact. Firefighters, workforce, emergency personnel, trash collection, if you're at the local level, um, pension contributions, all those things kind of get baked in. Just real quick, Devin, I know LinkedIn also has a workforce confidence survey uh, yeah. that you, you put out new numbers every two weeks. Any quick takeaways from that? Absolutely. Yeah, this is a, a bi-weekly pulse of how American workers or workers in the U.S., I should say, uh, they could be of, of any nationality, are, uh, are feeling about their jobs, their personal finances and their career outlooks. Our most recent wave, which I should say was conducted the first two weeks of June, so a couple of weeks ago, had some interesting takeaways. And the, the one I'll highlight is that uh, a real jump in confidence among freelancers uh, contractors and the self-employed. And some of our reporting is uh, is bearing out that what's happening there is they are benefiting from companies big and, and medium sized that uh, are wary of adding full-time employees to the payroll in this still yeah. fragile economy. 
are seeking out those freelancers and contractors for projects and assignments. And uh, and those types of workers are are benefiting from that right now. And they really uh, have have jumped in their in their personal finance outlook for the for the next six months going forward. Yeah, lots of change, and uh, you know it's good for some and not as good for others. And I think there'll be more to come as we work through this. Well, Devin, I want to go to a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about a big financial firm shaking up its recruitment of new professionals. You're going to want to stay here, right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. The windows on our homes, they protect us in the ones we love, but they do much more. At Renewal by Anderson, making your home more comfortable is at the center of every window we make. It's why we custom build our windows in America and install them in as little as one day. It's why we build our frames with exclusive Fibrex composite material that's two times stronger than vinyl. It's why our glass helps keep your home warmer in winter, cooler in summer, and quieter all year long. It's why we stand behind every window with a 20-year limited warranty. Why not help lower your energy costs while giving your home and family the best? Call 1-800-835-6525 to schedule a free in-home consultation. Buy one, get one at 40% off with this special offer. Plus, get special financing with no money down, no monthly payments, and no interest for one full year. Renewal by Anderson, the better way to a better window. Call 1-800-835-6525 now. Welcome back. We're talking to Devin Banerjee. He's Senior Financial Services Editor for LinkedIn. Devin, thanks so much for staying with us this morning. Absolutely, Jeff. Happy to. So we talked about unemployment. We talked about the economy. This is a really interesting story, uh, the fact that there's a major financial firm that is shaking up its recruitment of new professionals that it wants to bring into its, or into its organization. What can you tell us about this? Yeah, Jeff, this is a story about Blackstone, which is one of the, you know, I should say, one of the most sought after, coveted places to work for finance and investment professionals in the industry. It's the largest alternative asset manager globally, uh, just north of half a trillion in assets. It's produced by my count, I think, five billionaires among its founders and senior employees over its history. Um, so, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find a, a junior uh, banker or investment professional who wouldn't want to or wouldn't consider working at Blackstone. And what they're doing, this is according to a, to a Wall Street Journal story uh, this week is they're really shaking up the traditional playbook of recruiting in private equity. That traditional playbook is to look to investment banks for uh, for, for, for young uh, professionals there who have spent a year or two learning the ropes, uh, learning, you know, corporate finance, uh, modeling, you know, the use of all the tools like spreadsheets, and then to pluck them from those banks 
for entry level positions at private equity firms. Hmm. Uh, so that's really been the major pipeline for these firms, as well as a little bit of direct recruiting from campuses, college campuses and business schools. What Blackstone is saying is they're really going to turn that on its head and they're going to sit out that former process of, of, of recruiting from investment banks and really go heavy on on-campus recruitment. And it's doing this to improve its hiring process and also to boost diversity. Now, Blackstone says this is a process that it's uh, been trying to put in place now since last year, um, not directly related to, of course, you know, the, the heightened focus on diversity uh, of the past of the past few weeks and months. But of course, you know, it, it is one of Blackstone's intentions to boost diversity uh, in its entry level funnel and and eventually into its into its upper ranks. So what Blackstone will do is now recruit, uh, as I said, directly from schools, about 44 schools this academic year, including historically black colleges and universities, as well as women's colleges. So that's 44 schools. That's up from just nine schools that it would recruit directly from about five years ago. Um, Blackstone said it will still uh, pluck from investment banks on an as-needed basis to fill certain holes or specific roles. Um, but again, it's really doing this to, 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 to boost its diversity. And Blackstone is really a bellwether uh, in the alternative asset space. As I said, it's the largest firm. It's often looked to for what it's doing, especially around uh, you know how it's institutionalized as a firm. A lot of these companies started as just partnerships mm -hmm. you know, with a couple of guys back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Blackstone has really turned itself into an institution of, of several thousand employees now. And in this wider alternative asset space, you know, fewer than 12% of senior roles right now are occupied by women. Even a smaller percentage are held by uh, black or Hispanic professionals. And so Blackstone is really trying to uh, take a leading role here in improving that hiring process and boosting diversity in, in the industry. So do you think that, I mean, based on the article, based on what you're hearing on the platform, that other organizations, other private equity alternative shops, and also those on Wall Street may follow suit and change their, I mean, obviously there's a lot of things that HR managers are dealing with right now, just keeping yeah. the operations going. But looking to bring in, I know a lot of summer internships though have been delayed or now people are working virtually so they're not right. being able to come into the office and work side by side with a partner or someone within the firm that's been impacted. But any any thoughts about how this could change uh, the way Wall Street recruits? Yeah, it's a bit too early to tell. I would say, you know, Blackstone benefits from having become so institutionalized. So it has a whole campus outreach and recruitment team. It's mm -hmm. able to invest in those resources. Other firms, especially, uh, you know, mid cap and smaller firms don't have those resources and they rely on the traditional uh, pipeline coming from investment banks. Um, but I would say, you know, Blackstone is a bellwether here and all of the firms do, or mo most of the firms do realize that, uh, that they do need a, a wider ap aperture and they need a, a more diverse pool to select from. And those investment banks have their own diversity challenges. So if your initial, you know, um, entry into the into the funnel is constrained from a diversity perspective you're just going to have uh fewer choices to to select from yeah. and stepping even further back you know the recruitment process for for private equity is insanely competitive it used to be that private equity firms would look about a year out for young investment bankers now that's become almost two years just in 2019 i did some reporting on LinkedIn for this, um, the recruitment process started in September of 2019 for private equity jobs that wouldn't start until the summer of 2021, almost two years out. So these firms were looking at junior bankers who have spent just a couple months on the job out of college and trying to determine, um, you know, their skills, uh, their talent, and and their expertise, which is very difficult to do. Well, Devin, it almost sounds like the NFL draft and it almost sounds like there's a combine where you go and you sit there and you're instead of doing the 40 yard dash you're doing how quickly can you do an excel macro and how you know effective is it uh, yeah honestly the stories are are wildly entertaining i'll share with you uh, after this jeff a, a, a post i reported out in in around september of, of 2019 when i learned that the process was kicking off i mean the and of course this was pre 
COVID pandemic. But, you know, these are junior bankers trying to do their day job while also jumping in and out of Ubers and cabs in New York City, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, et cetera, going from interview to interview. If you're lucky enough to get an offer, it could be what's called an exploding offer Mm -hmm. where you have just a couple of hours to accept it or it's gone. Uh, uh, because of how competitive this, pro- this process is. And these private equity firms used to have a loose agreement on when they would start recruiting so that no one jumped the gun. And then, of course, a couple of firms began jumping the gun and everyone had to pile in. And that's why it has become earlier and earlier and earlier. And now, as I said, it's almost 24 months in advance of the jobs actually beginning. So they have a stopwatch and they click it and how fast you can type that macro I guess things are ready to go. And I wonder, you know, the NFL has a big undrafted free agent pool from not big schools. I wonder if the same holds true in some of these, uh, if they're going to go outside the, the usual suspects in terms of business schools and go to that, you know, the, the kid from Akron, Ohio, who went to a Division II school, a great tight end, you know, the same kind of yeah. thing. You talk about diversity, maybe that's an area for diversity as well. Diversity, you don't know, get the same thinking process that you would with yeah, the top 20, top 25. Days exactly. And, 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 and look, I'm sure Blackson will continue, you know, hitting the Harvard campus and Stanford, University of Chicago, et cetera, et cetera, Penn and Wharton. But but they have intentionally said they will add HBCUs, women's colleges. And look, I, I mean, the reason I'm highlighting the story is here's a company that is trying to walk the walk a bit on a lot of the uh, the commentary we've seen coming out of companies and their leadership in the past few weeks and months. And these are some concrete steps. Of course, Blackstone is, as, I, as I've said, privileged to have the resources to invest in campus recruitment and outreach. But here are some concrete steps that some of those companies with similar uh, levels of resources can take. Well, they're privileged, but they also built it from the ground up. So they built it into what it is, and therefore they're reaping the benefits of being able to select future candidates the way that they want to select future candidates. Devin, always a pleasure chatting with you. Really interesting stories this week. Look forward to having you back on the program next week. Take care, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Sounds good, Jeff. Take care. And that wraps up this episode of BRN AM. Have a topic of interest or someone you think we should talk to? Drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the news in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, and more, check out today's edition of The Morning Pulse. Don't forget, we're back again tomorrow with our weekly show, BRN Weekly. We've got a very special guest. We're going to learn about the real estate market and how it's changing in Charlotte. So until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Attention. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has officially authorized new benefits that Medicare Advantage plans may include. To get the benefits you deserve, you can call the Medicare Coverage Helpline. Hi, I'm Joe Namath. If you're on Medicare, this is important information. I called the Medicare Coverage Helpline and they instantly looked up my coverage. In this one simple call, they offered to enroll me in a plan that includes rides to medical appointments, private home aides, doctors and nurses visits by telephone, and even home-delivered meals. The plan also includes dental, vision, hearing, and prescription drug coverage, all at no additional cost. Don't delay. Call to see if the new benefits are available in your area. Call the number on your screen now. It's free. Call 1-800-757-1451. That's 1-800-757-1451.